It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. This is Austin Peterson, your co-host with Landon Mance, as always, coming to us from Las Vegas, Nevada. Until next week when he will be in studio with us. We're looking forward to having you here next week, Landon. Thank you for joining the show as usual. Thank you, sir. Yes, and we're happy and excited to have the Spitfire herself, Jane Powers, in the uh, in the building today. Jane is an author, sales trainer, public speaking trainer. Um, basically, if you can think about any portion of your business that uh, that you need help with, Jane may be able to step in and help. Jane. Thanks for being here. You bet. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate now I'm just realized I'm a tycoon. Yeah. Well that sounds awesome. <laughs> and you should you should feel honored. I tell you. This is uh I think episode number thirty, if I'm not mistaken. We've been doing this since Cinco de Mayo and uh and we're excited to have you here. So Jane, we always start by having our guests tell a little bit about themselves personally. We talked a little bit before we went on air and so we we learned a little bit about you, but uh Share with our listeners uh, kind of, you know, your history. Uh, you can tell us about your family, whatever you'd like, and then uh, and then give us a career history, and uh, and we'll go from there. You bet. So the good news is we did some sharing off air, and we'll keep that off air. So <laughs> yeah. we are making sure this is a family show. So, again, my name is Jane Powers. I am originally from Chicago. I like to say I'm from Chicago. It just sounds really cool. Uh, I'm actually from Naperville. That is just... <laughs> <laughs> It's not very cool. It doesn't sound tough, it does, but I love saying Chicago. But I am actually from Chicago area. Uh, Naperville is uh, a suburb um, from there. I moved into the Denver area and then landed in Phoenix. I actually wanted to come to Arizona when I left high school because I played basketball. That is something you look at me and you are not in the studio, but I'm about all of five I'm going to lie and say 5, 4.5. <laughs> it may be. I think I shrunk, but I wanted to come here and play at ASU. Now, I know you U of A fans are going to say, bah, but they had the coolest uniforms, and I thought I would look really good in the ASU colors and the uniform. But I ended up going to NIU, which is Northern Illinois University, and playing basketball. I was a point guard, had a scholarship, and worked my way through college. Nonetheless, I ended up here in Phoenix, Arizona. I have had many careers as we have spoken about, but let me tell you the first career. The first career was working through the lifetime of my family. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I am the youngest of seven. I grew up in a very interesting family for lack of a better term and had started my career actually started in the prison. I knew that I wanted to, I work with special populations and I knew I wanted to work with individuals that were special. And I found great challenges and interesting opportunities in the prison system. From there, I went into the Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center. And as I mentioned before, I then worked in the community working with juvenile delinquents, survivors of sexual abuse, doing interventions, blowing up families and saving kids from the unfortunate, um, you know, occurrences within their family. And then went into the title business down here in Phoenix and moved into being a real estate broker. So for the last 13, 15 years or so, I've been a real estate broker and investing more of my own personal investments in real estate. That's my addiction. And I'm here for our first meeting. But I will then, I also am my, as you said, I'm a business coach and strategist specializing in messaging and sales. As I'm biased. That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I get it. I mean, I, I could make a joke about, you know, 
I can understand why you'd go directly from working with juvenile delinquents and people who are having problems right into the real estate industry, right? Because it's just full of snakes. Is that what you're telling me? Well, and and (laughs) it's actually it well prepared me to work with adult delinquents. So I'm well versed in in working with individuals. (laughs) Yeah, no, we we actually have a lot of respect for those in the real estate industry. We've had some on the on the show and and we both have members of our family and people that we know uh, very well that are in the real estate industry. But I couldn't I couldn't pass that one up because I'm thinking, how in the world do you go from working with juvenile delinquents to title and then ultimately real estate? But it's a financial motivation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I pretty much was volunteering <laughs> back then, making a buck fifty an hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Well, I, I tell you, you know, Landon and I both have some experience with how you started your career, not that either of us have ever been in prison. Yet. I was going to say, I thought I recognized right. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we haven't been in prison yet, but I come from a family of recovering alcoholics. I have a younger brother that has been an addict for a very long time and, and has actually been clear, clean for the longest time of his life, maybe, I want to say about six years now. Um, and so he's kind of turning his life around. He's in a, he's in a, in a good relationship right now. He's doing things that he needs to, to kind of take care of his daughter. And, you know, so I have a special place in my heart for people who, who help them and and work through those issues. Uh, luckily for me, alcohol and drug addiction has not been a part of my life personally, but the other thing that resonated with me is that my wife is also the youngest of seven mm. children. Oh and so it's, it's uh, not often that you, that you meet people uh, nowadays that are the youngest of that many children. Um, although I do have a sister-in-law with a blended family now, so divorces and then families blended together that have a total of 11 children. Oh, my. That's, that's the big difference. My mother uh, was the youngest of 12 kids. And we were a, a Catholic family. I don't know if that matters, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure back in the day it was the culprit. But interestingly, my sister had six kids. I'm thinking, why did you not learn anything from watching our family? But, you know, <laughs> un- unfortunately, many, many, when I was a, a young girl, uh, my mother, my mother was actually an alcoholic for her whole, my entire life, not my oldest brothers and the rest, but passed away when I was just uh, 14 years old. So I think that put me on my mission to say, you know what, I'm going to find a way not to save other people's mothers, but to save the kids that are, quote unquote, victim to the disease. Yeah. And and really understanding it's not about you, but it's about the disease. So yeah, that was my very much my passion. And then all the other work was just about saving someone or saving myself. Because I think all the work we do in the world is it's people always ask your why. Like, what's your why? Yeah. Eh, it's great. I can want to save the world, world peace, whatever it is. But I always believe there's a why behind the why. And the why behind the why is always, in my opinion, selfishly motivated. Like I want to, my why is, yes, I want to make a difference, but it always comes back to where do we get that motivation? It's because of our own personal experiences. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fair to say, because even philanthropic things that that I do or that Landon does or any of us do in in our lives, you know, we we do have a why. And we recently had somebody on or a couple of guests on um, for a a nonprofit that I'm on the advisory council for, for brain injury, right? So that same brother that suffers from addiction, one, we know that that changes their brain chemistry. But in addition to that, he was also thrown from a vehicle in a rollover accident. Mm. So that plus a couple of other things is my wife for being involved in that. But it still is a personal thing for me, right? I do still have my own personal reason to do that. I can say that it's fully for others, but the reality is it, it's about my, you know, my personal desire to be there and to, to participate in that. And truth be told, our selfish motivations always help the world. I mean, so be selfish all you want because you are serving the world. So, uh, but I think people are always, they're afraid to be selfish, but the selfishness actually contributes to selflessness. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've certainly never seen it quite that way. But when you do put it that way, it does make me think, and Landon's probably thinking the same thing. It makes me think of a past guest, Mike Michalowicz, who wrote the book Profit First, right? And I think a lot of people see that title on the book and they think, 
well, another greedy business owner, mm. right? And, and and that's not the the message. The message is if you're not profitable as a as a corporation, you can't help anybody else. You can't hire any more employees. You can't grow your business. You can't pay more in taxes. You can't contribute to the economy. You can't do any of those things if you don't take care of the profit first in the business. I, I completely, it's interesting. I, gosh, we're going on about 16 years ago. I was doing a back to school volunteer and I'm not a big volunteer. I'll give, I'll throw money at things. I'm, you know, I think, I don't know. I'm just, I, I, I'm not sure why, but nonetheless, I decided this time I was going to take these kids and get them their school stuff. And, and so I went down into the projects of Phoenix and picked up a couple of kids, took them to Walmart, filled the cart and took them home. And this little dude came up to me. He was about 10. His clothes were about half the size that they should be. And he said, you know, I'm Daryl Robinson. I want to know who you are. I need to know what to do. And he, I, I immediately, I don't really like kids. I probably shouldn't say that. I apologize, <laughs> kids in the world. They dig me. I just like, they're just little monsters in my opinion. But I, I all right. So anyhow, <laughs> this 10-year-old kid, I said to him, you know, I, all right, I'll take you shopping. Well, he just, I fell in love. And 16 years later, he is unofficially my adopted uh, 26-year-old boy. I say that, but he's a kid. And we were just talking the other day because uh, we're looking for a car. Please. God never let me have to do that for another 20 years. But hmm. I am talking to him and he was saying, you know, what really bothers me is I want to help everyone. And anytime I look at an individual that I want to help, I'm thinking I should give them money. I should help them buy this. And he said, oh, my God, I don't have enough money to give anyone. I have just enough for me to make it buy. And it just reminds me of what you're saying. Profit first is absolutely imperative so that you can do what you wish to do. And it isn't about greed. It isn't unless you're looking to take it from someone else. But it's truly about what is the mission and what good can I do in the world? And, and you know, Daryl says that all the time. He's like, I would, I would help the entire world. And it motivates him to make more and more money. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, I don't know, Daryl, he sounds like a great kid or great adult now. I mean, 26 years old, but um, my wife is that same way. My, my wife would do anything for anybody, spend every hour of her day helping somebody else, spend every dollar that we have trying to, to help somebody else. And, and it, you know, it's, it comes from a good place, right? But at the same time, reality has to kick in, right? We, yeah. we have to take care of ourselves before we're able to take care of others. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I look back and I, if there is a bird, if there is, I am chasing every animal, child, you know, adult to make sure that they're, if they're a wounded bird, I'm going to help them out in any way I can. You know, I, I think back when we're talking about that, it has given me the opportunity as I grow my business. I had, when the market crashed, I had a couple of friends that were down and out and I literally bought houses for them. I could not do that if I didn't do the business that, you know, yeah. had the mindset in business of winning in order to then support. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess the, the one thing that I would add to that, though, is that it can also overcorrect the other direction. Right. And so you're you've constantly got this mindset of, well, when I've got 10 million in the bank, then I'll I'll set up a foundation and I'll help do this. Right. But the reality is we all have the ability to help in our own way, right? So if you don't have the financial means, volunteer. If you don't, if you don't have the time to volunteer and you have the financial means, whatever your financial means are, there are plenty of nonprofits and charities out there that could that could use whatever it is that you're able to contribute. I love that we're talking about this because it's not we're not revealing this yet, but uh, we're bringing into the valley an organization that is where profit and nonprofit meet. So bringing the heart back into the business, and I'm actually going to be kicking that off here in December. So we will have conversations of how we can bring the world together so that people making, you know, making a difference through nonprofit can be supported by uh, those that are running a business. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no doubt about it. Landon, you got to take care of yourself before you can take care of the twins, right? <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you guys were talking about that because I, I was thinking one of the things that I'm really fascinated by is some of the previous work that you've done, Jane, is uh, you mentioned you've done a lot of turnaround work. And uh, so speaking of, of wounded birds, right, 
maybe talk to us just a little bit about, you know, some of the work that you've done there. And I, I guess really the reason I'm fascinated by this and asking about this is because, you know, we've got a lot of business owners, you know, that are listening to this call and their businesses have suffered immensely due to, due to COVID. And so I thought it would be valuable for uh, you to shed some light on what are some of the things that you have done, some practices, some things that our business owner, uh, you know, uh, listeners can, can uh, adopt or, or consider to, you know, help, you know, turn their businesses around and, and, you know, help them thrive coming into 2021. So a couple of different things. So as uh, in the employment industry, I became the turnaround specialist. And what basically it was is we have profit centers, <laughs> using the term very loosely, that are in the red. And they would tell me to go in. And this was, I, it was many years ago. So I was young, had no self-esteem, and I was a very nice person. <laughs> not that I'm not now, but I'm not as nice as I was. And I was so afraid to terminate anyone because they gave me the power. Go in, fire it, will do what you have to do. And my first stop was uh, out of Illinois was Denver, Colorado and Joyce West. Joyce West was 73 years old. They purchased the company from her 38 years prior to that or 34 years prior. I was supposed to go in and straighten Joyce out or fire Joyce because we were rolling out a new sales program. And I went in and had the conversation with Joyce. Now, this was very much like I worked in the prison. In the prison, you go in and you conquer the lead gang member. Once you do that, now you become the lead. So I was skillful at monitoring and, and sending the gang leaders to ADSEG. So I became a pretty prominent figure within the prison system because they knew don't mess with the little gal. So I go in, Joyce West, she was probably about my size. Joyce, all she had to look at me, she looked at me, I went into my corner office and cried. And I thought, oh my God, I am <laughs> sunk. I'm going back home. I can't do this. So I decided to figure out how can I maximize the team because Joyce was the gang leader. So I went in and I asked Joyce, what do you love to do? And she told me, I love my clients and I love connecting with my clients. I said, excellent. What do you hate to do? And she said, your new sales program. And I said, <laughs> well, Joyce, what if you gave me two weeks? Just give me two weeks to capitalize on who you are and what you can do and then decide if you love or hate this program. I said, just a deal, two weeks. And she said, absolutely, two weeks. What I did was I found what her strength was and what she loved to do. And I morphed the sales program into Joyce's unique style. By two weeks, Joyce was the top sales person within our organization. And the owner of the company called me and he said, what in God's green earth have you done to Joyce? She's actually friendly, motivated, and now is pushing the sales program. So I tell that because a lot of times what happens in our industry is in the industry of small business ownership is we look at what someone else is doing and we cram ourselves into that round peg, we're, you know, round peg square hole. And we're cramming ourselves into that, trying to do it like everyone else or the top producers, or we become, we try to mimic rather than model. So in this situation that we're in, I, I, and God, I can't stand the word pivot. And I apologize if it, it, you know, you see it everywhere. Pivot should only be in basketball. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's when I'm pivoting. What, what, She's using that pivot foot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What I believe is that do what you do best, just do it better. Just do it better with accurate strategies because many people are doing the shotgun approach. They're hoping something lands. And again, I told you I'm biased. Speaking, your messaging is vital and selling. And if you have the right message, your sales conversation becomes nothing except what's the best credit card to put this on. So when individuals are going through and, and, and trust me, I'm feeling it. Our business was based on me standing on stages, free or paid, and speaking, having our own events closing, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in three days. Think about that. We have not had a three day event this year. 
So reinvention, it's not an option for me. What's an option for me is take what I do, maximize it in a new platform. And then the sales conversations, like I said, have been, uh, they become easy. So in this, I think what you say, how you say it and who you say it to is, doesn't matter if you're on or offline. It does not matter. So how do we know if we have a good or bad message? <laughs> Call me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless sales plug insert here. <laughs> Seed now. Uh, he- here's the truth. You watch the person. And are they handing you a credit card? So I have my claim to fame. This is total plug. But <laughs> my claim to fame is my intro commercial. We literally trademark that. Registered trademark intro commercial. Basically, it is ditch the old-fashioned elevator pitch. So the very first thing I can tell you, if you are saying I help, immediately that is negative messaging, in my opinion. It sounds like you're a volunteer. So if I can give one pointer, if you are introducing yourself, whomever your ideal audience is, business owners, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, organizations, corporations, hire me. That is, that is your first out of the gate key statement that says, I have a viable business. I'm not a volunteer. So it is entrepreneurs, whomever it is, hire me too. And then it moves into your holy grail. I have a total formula that is based on brain science and the science of Jane, which is very proven, just so you know. (laughs) After 30 years of sales and 30 years of speaking, I took everything and crammed it into this formula that 17.5 seconds, that's my intro commercial, takes 17.5 seconds. And what happens is people lean in. I had an individual that I did my intro commercial. And she went, I need to talk. And I said, excellent. Hop on a call. 20 minutes. Uh, It was about a $24,000 package. So 20 minutes, 17 seconds. That's a pretty good payday. Yeah. Can we hear yours? You bet. I'm just waiting. (laughs) I'm giving you a nickel for that transition because that was epic. You're a pro at this interviewing. So it depends who I'm in front of. Since I have business owners, and entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs hire me to speak with confidence and sell with authority because most are not articulating their message clearly enough and leaving opportunities empty handed. So I help them connect, capture and close their ideal audience. Bottom line, you must unleash your unfair sales advantage. Boom. Speak with confidence, sell with authority happens to be my book. (laughs) God, could I stop plugging? Yeah. You want to know what my unfair sales advantage is? (laughs) This face for radio right here. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you know, it it does actually make me think about it, right? Because I I feel like Landon and I, and we're honing in on on this merger and and the branding that we're going to go with, right? And and right now we have two separate brands and we're we're honing in on where we're going to go. And we've talked at length about this. And Landon will tell you that he likes my tagline or, you know, exactly what you're talking about, your intro commercial. But it does say serving the needs of. And all we would have to do is change it to business owners hire us to. What is your tagline? serving Serving the financial planning needs of small business owners, their executives and families. Sorry, my brain start. That's why I'm looking. Because when, when Landon, I'm like asking about the business, what, I've sort of like that Rain Man brain when it comes to messaging. So as he's talking, it's like in my brain, I'm like rearranging the words and, and, re- and adding some things in there. Because he, here's the truth of the matter. You can swing a dead cat and hit a coach. And, and unfortunately, the same is almost true for financial planners, uh, yep. real estate. I, when I was in real estate, I'm like, oh. Everyone, everyone has their license. Right. And, and what it is, it's what is your unique, what is your unique value proposition? As they say, that's the most important thing is what do you do better than anyone else? Like a lot of realtors will say, oh, I give, uh, it's great service. I'm like, Rah. everybody says that every, yeah. I care about your family. Yeah. So, okay. Do you like, if you do, that's great. But what is your unique strategy that has you stand out. That's the holy grail. 
The yep. holy grail of what you do is how do you leverage, leverage to millions? Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe just clar- I'll clarify that for you. So it's, you know, Backbone Financial is my brand currently. We're looking at some variations of that. And so it's serving the backbone of America, the small business owner, their executives and families, right? So it, it certainly could be cleaned up. Like you said, they, people hire us to do this, right? And so, you know, not that we're going to do some sort of a, get a free consultation from you here, but. Oh, you will. You will. <laughs> Cause it, it's killing me. It's killing me right now <laughs> because here's what happens. And I, and financial there's, I, okay. Another thing that I have done in my sales training. And again, I confess this and I know we're on the air live. So anybody can come after me. I have ripped off every personality profile on the planet, put it in the science of Jane and came up with our core communication system. And it's how do individuals communicate what they do or their sales conversation. And, and normally, not always, but My attorneys, my financial planners, my people with doctors, they love information. So they feel they give so much information that what ends up happening is the listener is getting lost in the minutia of the message. So what I do is succinctly and sexily, is that a word? Can we say that on the air? Now we're moving into our other show. (laughs) I help them truly succinctly communicate their message. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we could certainly tighten it up. I mean, maybe Landon wants to take a second and just explain, you know, what we do that's that's different. I mean, we we do f- truly believe that our process is different than most financial planners. Right. And I even just I gave a I gave a presentation in my Vistage group a month ago and I've known these people for a year and a half. They know what I do. We've had conversations about certain things. And then I got up and I gave a presentation on what it is that I do. And three people said, yeah, we probably need to talk. That, that's not <laughs> nice. what I thought you did. Right. Nice. And so yeah. because everybody assumes financial advisors or financial planners, oh, you're going to help me with my investments or you're going to help me with my insurance or you're going to help me do this or do that. And it's all around just just investments and insurance. And we talked a little bit off, you know, off air before we started. We serve business owners and a lot of them don't have any investment outside of their business. Right. Most business owners. plus of their net worth is in their business itself. And so if there's no investments to manage, how is it that we get compensated? Well, it's tough for us to get compensated without charging a fee for our advice, but it's really the process that we follow in helping that business owner first identify, is my business able to be sold to somebody else in the future? And if it is, how do we get there to where an exit makes sense for me, right? Does it make sense for me to sell it to my management team? Does it make sense for me to transfer it to my family member? Does it make sense for me to sell it to an outside buyer? Am I financially and emotionally ready to exit this business? That is a process that is very different than than most. And I've, I've yet to meet other financial planners that go through that exact same process that Landon and I go through with our clients. And so that's what's unique for us. Now you've got 30 seconds to give us an answer on what we should do. (laughs) <laughs> and start the timer. <laughs> now, you know, it's funny, Landon, I, you know, I was, you were asking about what can people do during this time? And Austin is just sharing that he, he went out and gave a presentation. I'm telling you what I do with the intro commercial is people say, oh, you have 60 seconds to introduce yourself. That is a lifetime for me because 17 seconds, 17.5 seconds, it is, Uh, uh, that's my intro. People are already leaning in. Then I give value and then I have a call to action. So what ends up happening is most people are like, oh, I started my business and it's this dream and what the, you know, all the, no, God, this is so terrible. I'm going to say it. Nobody cares about your story. Nobody, nobody does. People care, but they care more about their story. So in the delivery of anything, it's about, we know this, it's what's in it for me. And many people want a signature story that is in their signature talk. I say have a signature story that others can fill in the blanks with their own story. That's when people are buying. But, it, but going back to the intro commercial, I literally will take and we'll do this then on air you'll do your intro commercial every time you get on air. I will write one for you. 
that you're going to go, all right, all right. And people are going to sit up and listen and go, now we exactly know what they do. Because just these few minutes, what I understand is when I sit down and create a business for someone or their talk or their messaging, I begin with the end in mind. Most Stephen Covey, trademark. Yeah, most. Oh, thank you. Because, you know, I quote and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I say that. It was my quote. Like, because we say it so often, it's like, I always say. But it is begin with the end in mind. And when people, some, start a business, it's a dream. And they they want to hang a shingle and live that dream. There is so much that goes into it. I have people come to me sometimes and I'm like, you know what? you probably should just get a job. Business ownership, entrepreneurship, running an empire is not for everyone. Right. It is not for everyone. And and sometimes, like you said, I, I know I started my business because I wanted to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. I, I still think I think that. But I, didn't, I never thought from the perspective of how do I leverage my time, my money, and have an exit strategy. Yeah. Well, as Matthew McConaughey says, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, think that's a good, I think that's a good chance for us to take a break and hear from our sponsor and we'll come back. We've got so much more to unwrap here with, uh, with Jane. We're grateful to have you here with us listening today. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We're here with Jane Powers today, and I feel like we've already un unpacked about uh, a year's worth of uh, a content in about 30 minutes, 32 minutes, I guess it is. Landon, you've got this uh, look on your face that you're just, I, I'm not sure if you're afraid to ask something because you're not sure where it's going to go or if you just can't wait to ask something. I, are you saying I'm unpredictable <laughs> or are you unpredictable, Austin? Uh, it, it could be both of us. <laughs> and has anybody picked up that's listening, Austin Powers? Amen. Oh, behave. Okay. <laughs> that was my comedy for the hour. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. Okay. Love it. And, and to your point, Austin, I think I'm experiencing just a, a little bit of both of those two, you know, uh, emotions. But I love what you're saying about um, messaging, having this kind of authority. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about in in my own business. So I would love to hear your thoughts on why speaking is so important. And before you answer that, um, I just want to I want to make a comment about that because, in my experience, um, you know, I I probably spend a little bit too much time around educating myself, which entails listening to podcasts, listening to webinars, going to conferences, because I am always looking for just little nuggets that I can take back and share with my business owner clients in hopes that it brings some value, you know, to, to what they do. So I'm going off on a tangent here, but yeah, I, I want to know why is it so important? You know, why is speaking such an important business strategy that we all need to consider? There's, a, I have 4,000 answers and we have, we're going to put more than a week's <laughs> content into this. Okay. So there's a few different things. The very first thing is nobody else is going to talk about you. Like, that's just the truth. Everybody's out there. They go to grin and grippers. That's what I call them. You're grinning and gripping and shaking hands. <laughs> and God, I hope you're my client. Are you my client? Do you want to buy my stuff? You know, <laughs> this is what I feel is the model. I, I don't truly network as much as if I go to an event, I want to be speaking. Like my mindset is I need to be in front of the room making a difference for the room. There's three key components in your message that must be there in order to call people to action. So I'm going to just ramble them off. I don't want to teach too much, but I think it's going to give you a great piece of understanding. So the very first thing is position me. Position me says I'm awesome. That's basically it. What have you done and why are you better than everyone else Like at what you do? So what is your unique quality that you bring? For example, when I position myself, I talk about 
speak with confidence, sell with authority. Immediately, people know I'm a speaking and sales coach. They know immediately that's my expertise. Then I inform them I've created three multi-million dollar businesses. I've turned profits around 240% in 11 months. I've done all these things. I'm a multi-million dollar real estate investor. What people are hearing are numbers, stats, and data that they may not have, but boy, they want or they can relate to. And I'm living proof and an example of what they too can have. <laughs> or maybe they look and go, nah, we don't like you. Then they don't want any of that. That's okay. So position me. What have you done? And I tell people, take this old fashioned thing called a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle. On the left side, put every job you have had. On the right, put every problem you solved. Then you start to look and go, <laughs> I'm awesome. Now, You're standing in front of a room or you're virtually connecting with someone and you're able to position yourself. So first is position me. Second is position them. You must position your audience understanding they have a problem or a pain that you can solve and you help them kindly. I like to say because most instead of because you all are. Now, my intromercial used to be because most are boring, confusing and inconsistent. And it's true. And I didn't want to offend anybody, but it was so true. People would come up to me and say, oh, my God, that's me. I'm all three of those. Or they'd come up and go, oh, that's not me. Come see me speak. And I'm like, "Okay, if I come see you speak and you're any one of those three, you will hand me a credit card. Do you have any credit cards I've gotten? Because I sit there, I'm like, (laughs) oh, you're all three. Check those boxes. So position them is help them understand they need you. And that's by listing out pain points of your ideal client. The third one is position your offer. What is your call to action? Connect with me. Go to this URL. Click here. Scan this. Do something. So messaging isn't just teaching because teaching can give information that the individual may, if you give too much information, the individual do one of two things. One, there are deer in headlights. All of a sudden they're like, I can't do it yet. It was a lot of information and it's confusing, especially in the financial world. People have avoidance behaviors in the financial world. And once they hear financial planner, whatever wealth manager, says, oh, variable life, whole life, you know, all the other lives that are out there. And then they want me to buy all these things. And people don't understand how to leverage their profits. That's my business is all based in how do I leverage the profits to gain more assets that can then serve the world. But nonetheless, where was I? I have no idea. (laughs) Moving into positioning your offer. You got to tell them to do something because you've said, I'm awesome. You're screwed. Now do this. If you don't say do this, you're just a mean person (laughs) because you've left them hanging with a problem. Now we move them into action and the action is either you or a referral by you. So. That is, I think, speaking also, instead of chasing one-to-one, you are one-to-many. Mm-hmm. I can stand in front of a room. My first, there is a, you probably have heard this about the pay-to-play system. Pay-to-play means I'll write a check, I'll get on your stage, and I hope I make my money back. My very first one out of the gate, I thought, this is awesome. I paid $17,500. I had nothing to sell. I didn't know, I couldn't talk about my business and it was for, wait for it, 15 minutes. It was the dumbest investment of my life. But when I hit that stage, I spoke effectively. I made up my call to action because I'm pretty quick on my feet. And it was, thank goodness, it was a break even. Well, I learned from there how to effectively be in front of an audience to move sales. And that, that's the key. So it's not just going and speaking for the sake of speaking. What I say is stop talking and start speaking. Speaking is delivering a position me, position them, position the offer in order to serve at a higher level and to grow your business. I love that. I love that. So speaking of growth, um, talk to us a little bit about in your experience, what are business owners, what are the biggest mistakes that they're making while trying to grow? There's, do we have, how long do we have? I'm kidding. (laughs) There's, I think the biggest mistake people they're making is they're trying to do too much. 
They're trying to go, okay, I need all the bells and whistles of a business. I am a firm believer, go out and make a ton of money and then start having people do the work for you. Start to allocate your funds effectively. And, and you know, I love you guys because it is about how do I leverage the money I'm making in my business? Now I'm plugging for you. Look how good I am. <laughs> hey, God, everybody, I'm good. <laughs> everybody loves this. I got to be honest with you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hate me for loving me. <laughs> um, you know, it's what's valuable is that it is about how do I leverage money legally, effectively, and profitably. And and that is my entire mindset. When I do anything in my business, I think from, okay, what do I, where am I allocating these funds? What money do I want to make and why? I can't remember your question, but I'm going to get, I'll make something up. <laughs> the <laughs> stakes, mistakes, mistakes made for growth. Yeah. So yeah. they're trying to do so much have, I, I tell you, I made my first half million, no website. I think I had a business card. I think it had, it might've had my picture because I was in real estate also. And we love our pictures of yeah. ourselves on our cards. And, you know, maybe it had stars and moons because I was a spiritual life coach for a minute, but I'm at my first half million, no brand, no cards, no website. Literally, I had nothing. My claim to fame, and I wanted to prove this, is you can make a million without having all those bells and whistles. It is a message. It is an ability to have an authentic conversation that sells. And that is all. And I proved that by going out, doing my business with nothing. And then I thought maybe I should have a brand because I was all over the place. But be all over the place. People always say, oh, I just want to have, I want to be brave and have it all together like you. And I thought, oh my, <laughs> you should raise the bar a whole lot higher. <laughs> like you could be a hot mess and still make a million and serve the world. Amen. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You, so two things that I, I kind of um, got from what you just talked about. There's a guy that I, I not follow, but I, I listen to some of his podcasts and he is in our field and he, he serves private business owners. And one thing he talks a lot about is making yourself operationally irrelevant in your business. And I think that's kind of what you were alluding to is that when you start to make enough money and you can afford to hire other people to offload tasks to that, that you, you should do that. And that will help in your growth. I think that's kind of what I took away from that. And now I'm losing my train of thought because there was a second, there was a second point there. Oh yeah. You said something about, you know, when, when you're speaking in front of a group that instead of going out and connecting with people and having coffee and lunches one-on-one, -on -one, you have this ability to talk to 10, 50, a thousand people at once to convey your message. And that's what I absolutely love about becoming this speaking authority is that it's so much more efficient and effective, you know, instead of, like I said, instead of going out and having these one-on-one -on -one hour long conversations, you can speak to, you know, in 30 minutes to a hundred people or a thousand. And it's just such a better use of your time. So I, I love that. But I, I guess um, I kind of already asked you this, you know, why it's so important. But if if somebody is starting out on that journey, Jane, and they want to become this authority and they want to become a, a great speaker, but they they're just starting out. I mean, where where do you what's the first step to, to, to take on that journey? Call Jane Powers at. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, clearly it sounds like that that is, you know, a, a, a very viable uh thing to consider, but. So, it, and truly, it, it, obviously, that is my work in the world. And I am, I am a constant sales machine. Like, I'm always like, well, why wouldn't you just call me and let's work together? Like, it's a <laughs> no brainer to me. But let's say somebody's out there and like, yeah, it's a good idea. I don't know. I don't really like her, but I want to get an idea of how I can do this. So first thing is go through, position me, position them and position your offer. That is, there are seven key components in your talk that actually make you money. Those are the top three right there. Top three, position me. Because if you get up there and you start going on and on about what you do, nobody understands why are you the authority? Why do I, why do I need to listen? Now, I'll tell you what I do, because most of the anything that I do is I go and speak. And I have a mindset that as I'm driving to the event or flying to the event, 
I'm one of the, the upper echelon. I have that mindset. Like, I just go in thinking I'm going to take over the room. I'm going to command the room because that's part of who I've become in my work. And when I am going into the opportunity of speaking, I go in and people look and they're, and not to mention, I sort of dress a little less conservative. I've got leather pants on, you know, cool boots, cool jacket. It makes a statement. So first thing, make a statement with who you are and how you show up. Don't show up and hope that you're going to make a difference. Show up and know you're going to make a difference. So number one is make a difference when you walk in the room. You know, they say when you walk in, light up a room. Well, I say, man, set that room on fire the minute you walk into that room. When you hit the stage, you must. Here's a first tip. Have a wow factor. You guys need a cool wow factor. Your wow factor is a quote, a statement, a story that people go, oh, that's unexpected. How about singing? If you can sing, singing is awesome. I've, I, do, I've done that, actually. I, I spoke in front of a group of about 500 people, and I started by singing Sweet Home Alabama. I love that. <laughs> I have <Yeah>. clients that <laughs> can sing. God knows I can sing. I'm going to start a car band or a shower band because I'm really cool. But I'm telling you, I, anybody who can sing, oh, it's the best wow factor. You start and people are thinking, they are no ordinary speaker. Who, what the heck just hit us? My wow factor, I'll step on stage. I look at my watch. I look at the audience. I don't see anything. And I look again and I say, seven seconds, seven seconds, your mind has made a thousand computations about me. And then I go into this introduction that people go, oh, and then I position myself. So wow factor, position me. Position me, again, says I'm awesome. Position them. You're screwed in a really nice way. I don't mean to offend anybody. And then position your offer. Anybody, please, I, oh God, I shouldn't say this. I am a, I'm not one to say I'm working on my speaking or I've been to a certain organization that I'm learning to speak. People right away in their mind will say, oh, they have an enormous fear of speaking. Unless you're an award winner in certain organizations, I don't mention it. I don't mention it. Uh, what I believe is if you are starting out speaking, get a solid message, write your talk and throw away 50% of it because 50% of it is overloading. I have a speaker assessment. One of them is the overloader. The overloader wants to give the kitchen sink, the neighbor's kitchen sink, and every other sink on the planet into their talk. And it actually, it will lose you probably 40% of your sales. Yeah. And too many PowerPoint slides. Oh, <laughs> and don't read those PowerPoints. <laughs> oh my God. Have you ever been to one? And they actually turn their back to the audience to read their own PowerPoint. Yeah. I believe pictures a minimum, a maximum of 10 words per slide, if necessary. Yeah. I'm a big believer, if you're going to use PowerPoints, that it should just be a picture that invokes or evokes yes. some sort of an emotion and lets you know as the speaker, okay, this is what I'm covering right here. Yeah. Speak from the heart and just, you know, get that message out there. You know, when you talk about, you know, position me and then you're screwed, like you said, and then, you know, this is the call to action. So, I mean, Landon and I, we, we talk about that as a disturb, right? So we're disturbing yes. them on things that, oh my gosh, I fit into that category. What, what do I need to do to fix that? Yeah, I call it poking the bruise. Yeah. Don't put salt on the wound. Like that's <laughs> creepy sales, but just poke the bruise and help them understand you might have this problem. Yeah. Evidence by. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's a powerful process and, and, you know, I think, the hard part with what Landon and I do specifically is that a lot of financial advisors are out there doing these dinner or lunch seminars, right? And there are, you know, <laughs> sorry if you're listening, but there are people that we call professional plate lickers, right? They just show up <laughs> because they're getting a free meal from, <laughs> from showing up to listen to what we're presenting. I haven't done one of these in years, right? I've done some webinars. I've done some other presentations. I do different things, but I stopped doing that specifically for that reason because it is like a, a bunch of retirees, for example, that would just show up and, and it's a free meal and they're going to listen to your to your presentation. Um, and so I, I think it's about for us finding the right opportunities to speak to the right audiences with the right positioning for what it is that we're doing, right? Because we you've already learned that we're not generalists, right? That's not what we do. 
we have a specific niche. And so it's about finding those right speaking opportunities. And so I would guess that Landon and I will reconnect, of course, with you uh, regardless, but to, to talk to you specifically about, okay, how do we get in front of the right audiences ourselves that are going to grow our business? Because that's ultimately what we're trying to do, of course. Uh, any business owner should be, right? But I think that there are some things, obviously, for me, I sit back and go, yeah, I'm pretty good. There are some things that I need to work on. But what you brought to the table for me was, well, we could change that. We could change this. But we are in a pretty good spot. We're doing some things right. And and I think that's probably what people are doing in your audiences as well Is oh, man, she pointed out the fact that I'm not doing that great. But I am doing pretty good at this. And so you do kind of build them back up and make them feel comfortable with that. So I appreciate the messaging. I appreciate the way that it, you know, that you put it together. The last thing that will, you know, you've obviously put in your shameless plugs, which that's ultimately (laughs) why we invite you to be on the show. So don't feel, (laughs) don't, don't feel awkward about that. Even if we do rib you for it. Yeah. Me feel awkward (laughs) about plugging. That is, yeah. I, I play this, I teach, um, when I do a lot of, uh, workshops and speaker retreats and different things. We play a game called pickle, uh, not yeah. pickle, not pickleball, but it's called oh, pickle. Yeah. Like I will teach them any question that is asked of you will always come back to your business and messaging. So we play pickle all the time and everybody laughs. They're like, I, they can ask me anything. And I'll be like, Oh, pickles, pickles can be sweet. They can be, but you know what it ends up being like? It's like running your own business. Sometimes there are days it is like one sour gherkin and <laughs> you know, so it really, that it's no, I feel no shame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and, and you shouldn't. So let, let's let you have one final plug. Tell us where, where our listeners can find you. Um, and if you want to just give a little bit of a sales pitch with, along with that, great, but otherwise, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, website, all that kind of stuff. All you have to do is just Google Jane M. Powers. It might come up miracles most, most wanted, but you will also get social media. <laughs> but seriously, you, um, what I would love to do, because I've been going on and on about this infamous <laughs> intromercial, which has made people thousands and thousands of dollars, you can go to your speaker success kit.com and you get the entire script. It's free. And you get a webinar with me training it. So if you want your own intro commercial, I probably go into 432 other subjects because that's what I do. But if you go to yourspeakersuccesskit.com, you can opt in, grab a, grab the webinar, grab the script. I, you can find me at jnmpowers.com. We're doing a sales training December 10th. God, if I knew that URL, that wouldn't that be famous? That would be <laughs> awesome. But just reach out to me on social media anywhere you would like just and and reach out and I'll tell you December 10th uh also doing uh some masterminds coming up in January that has been for anybody who is looking on how do I how do I start to cultivate some leads in this uh lovely environment we're in I've been doing masterminds they're a little un a uh, little different than your classic mastermind but we've been running we'll have a couple of those again in January those have served uh, both myself and the participants. So we've got a ton of things coming up all the time. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. J- JaneMPowers.com, like you said, and then SpeakerSuccessKit.com. Your. Your speakers. Yeah, don't forget the YourSpeakerSuccessKit.com. YourSpeakerSuccessKit.com. Landon, anything else you want to to uh, add? Yeah, I, I would just say that... Uh, I think a lot of stuff you've shared is super valuable, Jane. I know that one of my very, very top clients um, I got from having a good positioning statement. Uh, You you might argue that uh, good good, uh, might not be how you describe it, but it was effective in that instance. So um, I I think what you are saying here is... uh, valuable and makes a ton of sense. And it's super relevant, especially as we all as business owners are coming out of this. Well, maybe we're not coming out of the (laughs) pandemic yet because things uh, seem to be getting a little worse here, but uh, we can utilize a lot of this stuff that you said so that we can uh, grow our businesses and uh, come out of this thing stronger. So thank you. You bet. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for being here. I I think really, if anything, uh, the message that we got was that there, there is the ability, regardless of your personality and whether or not you think you're a salesperson, right? 
And some people think that is a, is a bad word to mm-hmm. begin with, right? Um, that you have the ability to do this. If, if it's what you want to do, you have the ability to do it. And specifically in this COVID time, it, it's not just about surviving, it's about thriving. And, and I think if we put, our, put in the efforts in the right areas of our business, we can thrive in any economic environment. I totally agree. I think, yeah, I think the most important thing is to have a, sales is essentially an authentic conversation that somebody ends up giving you a credit card. And they th- people thank me for selling them. They're like, oh, my God, thank you for now taking all this money from me. <laughs> I'm like, well, I honored you. You honor me. Honor their yes, honor their no. There's nothing in between that. Yep, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jane. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there and to you. And we'll be back next week. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast.